Luke the 10th chapter, verses 38 through 41. I'll read it aloud as you read along with me silently. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She said, she had a sister rather called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. Martha was what? Distracted. One more time. Martha was? Distracted. Distracted. Slap your neighbor and say, I said, pay attention. Because it seems like you're distracted <laughs> by all the preparations that had to be made. So she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to come help me. And he says, Martha, Martha. Now, I want the Lord to call my name once. <laughs> but I'm going to get real nervous if he calls my name twice. <laughs> Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, really, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Pray with me, if you will. Lord, in the name of Jesus, give us focus right now. Help us now to see clearly what your intention is intentions and purpose are for bringing us here today. We cancel the distractions of the enemy and the voices that are even in our heads right now. We take every vain imagination captive under the authority of God which worketh within us. And we thank you in advance that you're going to continue to allow us to see what you desire of us so that we can receive from you. Cancel every demonic distraction sent to keep this word out of our hearts. We bind the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. Every confusion, every problem, every outside circumstance that is trying to invade the space of our thoughts, we take authority over it now in the name of Jesus Christ. We realize that as we learn to focus, the enemy will fight our focus. And so God, we want to serve him. Notice that he is evicted from this place that he has no power nor authority over your people. And we stand against him in resistance by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you said if we resist him, he will flee. Satan, your voice is silenced. The voice of pain that you have tried to put in front of us. The voice of depression and sickness and sorrow that has tried to invade the space of our mind. We bind it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us hear your word, O oh God. Let nothing come between what you desire to do and what you're about to do in us. Thank you in advance for focus. Thank you for letting this word increase our faith. And thank you in advance for favor. In Jesus' name. Come on, make the devil mad. Put a seal on it. In Jesus' name. Somebody bless him and say hallelujah and amen. Slap somebody high five on your way down to your seat and say, focus. focus. Pay attention. Focus. Focus. Whenever, whenever I would get in trouble when I was younger, my parents would get right in my face. And, and my mother would even talk through her teeth. She had this phenomenal way of talking. Mouth didn't even move. I said, focus. <laughs> My dad would get on his knee and get right face to face. Do you hear me? It was a whole different kind of do you hear me. It was a do you hear me. It was like, it was like Mufasa. <laughs> focus. Say it out loud. Focus. focus. Come on, that's what I'm believing God to do in this season. That's what I want him to do in 2020. I want this to be the best year that you've ever experienced. I want it to be the best decade of your life. Oh, you can praise God for it. I'm excited for you. I promise I am. I'm excited. I want it to be the best decade of your life. And the only way that that's going to happen, the only way we'll accomplish or achieve that is that you have focus. Focus. One of the most amazing things that I've ever witnessed in my life, and it is so uncanny and so unorthodox and it seems so unrealistic. But I don't know how many of you, if you're parents, I know you, relate, you can relate to this and attest to this. But I've gone in my son's rooms and um, 
during the time that they're supposed to be doing their homework. And I'll go in my son's room and he's doing homework, but he's got his ear pods on, in, earphones on, he's got his YouTube on the phone right here, he's got music playing in the background, and he's sitting at the computer doing his quote unquote homework. <laughs> and, and I'm always stunned by this. I'm like, how are you doing homework with all of these distractions or all of this stuff that's going on around you. I don't get it. And, and, and they both concede, no, I need this. This helps me do my homework. How does this help you do your homework? Well, to me, it makes absolutely no sense. To me, it just is it's asinine, it's unbelievable, it's unrealistic, it's unorthodox, it's just un. <laughs> Period. How are you going to do your homework with all of this happening with you? And so, Ultimately, what I decided one year, I said, you know what? I'm going to stop fussing about it. I'm going to stop telling them, take this off, take this off. I'll just wait until the grades come out. I'll wait till progress report time, and I'll see what the grades look like, and that'll tell me whether or not it's actually working. And so I, I, I have to concede when I'm wrong, I'm wrong. When they're right, they're right. It doesn't matter that I'm the parent, they're the child. Right is right. I don't care who you are and how old you are. And so I had to go ahead and concede that maybe, I, maybe they know something that I don't know. Maybe they're right. Because when report cards come out, my, both of my sons, they have impeccable grades. Their GPAs are extraordinary. My oldest son on the, on the ACT, when he took it the first time in the 10th grade, scored a 29. I said, oh. <laughs> well, let me shut my mouth. Turn the music up if you have to then. <laughs> what else you need? I realized in that moment that they have figured out a way or a system within themselves. I can't relate to it because it's not my system. But I realized that they figured out a system that they are able to be surrounded by the chaos or the confusion of all of these elements, which to me would be a distraction, and they're able to maintain some kind of way their focus. See, the true, the true picture of peace it's not the absence or the void of chaos. It's the ability to remain calm regardless of whatever else is going on around you. So regardless of how many things are happening in their space, they have figured out a system within themselves to remain focused or intentional about what it is they're concentrating on, which means that at some point, they even internally have to learn how to drown out the noise. Our concept of understanding is to kill the noise completely. But you will know that you know how to focus when the noise of this world does not stop you from being intentional and intense about what it is that you're focused on at that moment. When, you, when, when everything in your life can turn upside down, but you can still keep your praise intact, that's called focus. When the world comes against you and it looks like there's no way out of the situation that you're in, but you sit there and cross your legs, fold your arms, and still say, Lord, but you're still God? That's a different kind of focus. That's when you know you have your eyes on Jesus. That's when you know that you have your eyes on the source of your peace. That's when you can focus. When everything around you is turned upside down, but you're still sitting right side up. Anybody in here got that kind of focus? I'm glad y'all are honest about it. Tell your neighbor, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. The stuff go wrong, I go wrong. <laughs> stuff fall apart, I start falling apart. Anybody got that testimony? Come on and be honest with yourself. Yeah, things ain't happening the way it should happen. Money, funny, finances fickle. You laid me off my job. I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table. I ain't there yet. But my purpose and my passion in this season is to get there. Yes. To get to the point in the place where we are focused, where it doesn't matter the external circumstance. The joy that I have is not based on what's happening on the outside. It's based on what God is doing on the inside. Anybody, anybody in here focused? Proverbs, you might as well keep your Bibles out. I promise I'm going to throw some, a lot of scriptural texts at you today. Proverbs, the fourth chapter, verses 25 through 27. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought 
to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all of your ways. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Keep your foot from evil. This is going to be the year of focus for us. But I want to qualify it. I want to take it a step further. It's not just focus. Because I don't know if you figure this out. Everybody will focus on something. So it's not just focus that I want us to have, but I want us to have right focus. Are you with me? You will have focus on something. You're going to focus on something. Everybody focuses on something. Our attention, our mind, our eye, it veers towards something. But my goal, my prayer, my plea to God is help us to be focused on the right things. And here's what focus does. This is the benefit of having focus. When you have focus, it, you bear fruit and you win favor. The reason the enemy, focus is, is so important that the enemy will do everything that he can to distract you to take you away from being able to focus on the things of God because he knows that it will kill your fruitfulness and destroy your favor. And nobody wants to be in a posture or position where we are out of focus so that we lose fruitfulness and we lose favor. Let me give you a biblical precedent for it. Matthew 25 and 23, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Watch this. You have been faithful over a few things, so I will now make you ruler over many things. I'll say it a different way. You have been focused over a few things, so now I will make you ruler over many things. Are you with me? So what the enemy wants to do is hit you in a place and in a way that takes you out of faithfulness or focus because then you can no longer receive abundant favor from God. The enemy of focus is distraction. That is the direct enemy of focus. It's distraction. Distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. And for our spiritual purposes, let's understand it this way. A distraction is anything that takes your attention or your focus off God. Anything that takes your attention or your focus off God is a distraction. Let me say it again. Anything that takes your attention or your focus off of God is a what? Distraction. distraction. Anyone <laughs> that takes your attention or your focus off God is a what? Distraction. Is a distraction. And so the way the enemy breaks your focus is to distract you. And he has to break your focus to kill your favor. Because if you ever start walking in divine favor, you become the testimony. And the testimony is what fights the tactics of the enemy. He hates for us to be the testimony or the testament of what God is capable of doing. Because somebody else might see that if God did that for you, then assuredly he can do the same thing in my life. So he has to kill your favor so that you won't be a testimony and cause you now to walk outside of focus so that your favor falls. And when your favor falls, he points at your circumstance and says, see there? See what I'm talking about? God is not God. See there? He's not faithful. See there? You can't trust him. See there? You shouldn't be following him. See there? It doesn't matter. The whole reason is to destroy your focus so he can kill your favor. And watch this. If he makes you unfaithful, you lose favor. The whole purpose of trying to distract you is that he distracts you to make you unfaithful because unfaithfulness leads to lack of favor. So the key to your downward, downward ascension is distraction. It doesn't mean that God won't use you. It doesn't mean that your path is, is not, your destiny rather, is not accomplished in God. It just means that your path will be riddled with unnecessary turns and stumbles and falls and pain and heartbreak and heartache. It means that over and over again, you'll have to go through the consequences. Here's the thing that I want you, I want you to know about God. God forgives sin, but not remove consequences. Put that way you can feel it. So he will remove the sin. He forgives the sin. He says, I forgive you of your sins, but it doesn't change the consequence. Moses was incredible. 
led five million people out of the captivity of the Israel of the of Egypt and led the Israelites into the wilderness all the way over right to the promised land. Moses was an incredible leader, but Moses got distracted. David, David was one of the greatest warrior kings. Matter of fact, David was so incredible that God said, this is a man after my own heart. But David got distracted. Noah was an incredible builder, built this monstrosity to the exact measurements that God had given him, and he did it all by faith. But Noah was a drunkard. Noah, Noah liked to drink. He liked the bar. Come on, church. Church. I felt something right there. I don't know what I felt. <laughs> Solomon was one of the most wise men to ever walk the face of the planet Earth. He had incredible wisdom, but even Solomon lost focus. Adam and Eve. God's image bearers, the first people to populate the planet, but they lost focus. I, I want to put that in perspective because I want you to understand that it does not matter how great your purpose is, you are not exempt to distraction and you are not exempt from losing focus. I don't care how long you've been saved, how long you've been sanctified, fire baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you've been in church all your life. I don't care who you are and where you are or who you think you are. You are susceptible to losing focus. Distraction will tiptoe in your room, tap you on the shoulder, and take you off course just as quick as anybody else. That's why you got to be careful about those, talking about those who have lost focus because you don't understand that the same energy that roams throughout the land seeking whom he can take out of focus is also looking around, lurking around your house too. Yeah. Slap your neighbor and say, he's preaching to you. Yeah. Everybody has to work at focus. It does not come easy. You have to work at it. And trust me, you're not the first, nor will you be the last to be distracted. You have to work at being focused. Mark, the fourth chapter, the 19th verse says, And the cares of this world, the deceitful riches, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, chokes the word, and you become un 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 unfruitful. It chokes the word out of you. It's not that you don't have word in you. It's not that you're not standing on the word. It's not that you are not for the word. But all of these things work hard against you to distract you and keep you from focusing on the things of God. And whether you realize it or not, something always has your focus. The question is, what are you focused on? Are you focused on your job, your career, your vocation? Are you focused on the things of this world? Are you focused on riches? Are you focused on, on things that are outside of the confines or context of what God has prescribed as right or right standing in our lives? Our aim this year is not to focus just on anything, but it's to focus on the right things. Are you focused on power? And I'm not talking about dunamis power. I ain't talking about Holy Ghost power. I'm talking about a different ghost. Oh, Jesus, my Lord. Yeah, who killed ghosts? Is he dead? Or is he yet alive? <laughs> it's amazing. Listen, it is amazing how we are so consumed with focusing our energies and our attentions on things that are so unfruitful. Y'all remember the show Scandal? It had years, maybe a decade worth of time and that it was on TV and, and everybody was consumed with Scandal. And everybody wanted to know what was going on with Fritz and what was going on with Olivia. And Watch this. We were rooting for Fritz and Olivia, and it was adultery. And we were like, yeah, we want them to be together.
We were focused because we didn't miss one week. Not one episode. Did you see it last week? Child, yes. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So let's put a rule in place for 2020. Don't put anything before you that you don't want in you. Let that sit in your spirit for a few minutes. Don't put anything before you that you don't want in you. Because you become what you behold. And if you do not guard the gates of your entry, your eye gate, your ear gate, then you will eventually have seated within you the capacity to perpetuate what you have seen on television or heard on the radio or set and inter entertained in conversation. You've got to be a guardian and a protector because the enemy, he's not going to always be overt, but he is covert with his distractions. And it doesn't take much to take us and shift us and veer us off course. So you got to come into it with a mindset that I'm not going to allow anything that is not going to be fruitful in me to be in front of me. Walketh not, sitteth not, standeth. You cannot allow yourself to be consumed with things that will eventually consume you. Are you with me? And if you watch it long enough, it will change your language. It will change your attitude, your actions. It'll change your responses. You'll start responding like you've heard these things responded. Why do you think media is such a powerful instrument in the hands of the enemy? It can be used for the glory of God. It definitely has some good attributes. But media predominantly in this time is being used by the enemy. He has conquered various mountains of this, of this particular area. And he is using it to infiltrate our minds that he changes our behaviors. Changes how we dress, changes our conversation, our vernacular, our, 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 our sayings, our phrases. So you've got to be a guardian. If you're going to remain focused, you've got to understand that this is how the enemy comes in with distraction and guard against these things. Are you with me? Watch this. What, where does distraction come from? Two places specifically. First of all, it comes from the arousal of your senses. Here's the warfare. When the enemy is distracting you, the warfare is this. He's not going to put something in front of you that you don't like. It's going to look good, taste good, smell good, feel good, and kill you. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is what? destruction when the enemy distracted Eve he didn't put something in front of Eve that wasn't attractive your distraction will be attractive you're diabetic but the cake 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 come on somebody distractions are attractive it's something that appeals to your senses in Genesis 3 and 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, and then she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Not because it wasn't appealing. It looked appealing. It was attractive. My goodness, this apple. It is so plump and red. Juicy and just be calling me. <laughs> How do I protect against the distraction of this, cir this circumstance? Watch this. You need to know what you're attracted to. You need to know what arouses your senses. You need to know what tickles your fancy. You need to know what wets your whistle. You need to know need to know you need to know you need to know you need to know what distracts you and here's the thing about it you need to know for yourself because what distracts one will not distract another what appeals to one person may not be a problem for another person are you with me 
distractions are personalized. So it's important that this is, this is something that you do introspectively because nobody else can do this for you. You know the areas that the enemy will use to pull you in, to lure you in. The Bible says we are not ignorant of Satan's vices. We know because he's tried it before. Sometimes he tried and succeeded. Sometimes he tried and failed. But we need to know. And here's the, here's the real test. You need not, don't, it's not enough for you to know. You need to admit it. You need to be honest with yourself. And on, no, I'm not going to hang out with y'all because if I go hang out with y'all, you do X, Y, Z, and I'm going to end up doing X, Y, Z with you. There's some places I'm not going to be able to go because it, it, it takes me back to a person that I'm no longer. Are you with me? And some things that I don't need to do, so I'm not going to put myself in that position. Are y'all with me? It's midnight. What is he coming by for? I'm going to leave it right there. I'm going to drop it. I ain't going to push it. Just let that ride right there for a few seconds. Let it simmer in your memory. What you doing? Nothing. I'm going to slide through. No. Because if you slide through, you might... Sl and the Bible says... Hallelujah, Jesus. Children's church is next door. Glory to God in the highest... It arouses your senses. It titillates your sensibilities. That's where distraction comes from. The other place that it comes from, this is going to really be a hard pill to swallow. It, it also comes from your own dissatisfaction. You're dissatisfied with your circumstance and so your focus is broken. And your focus is broken because of the dissatisfaction inside of you. Are you with me? And lack of satisfaction leads to frustration. And the more frustration you amass, your emotions become torn and you're pulled in other directions because of the frustration and the frustration is seated in your own dissatisfaction. Here's the key. The key is to identify what is the underlying cause of your dissatisfaction and to fix it. It requires that you fix it. When you ignore it, you become more frustrated. And the more frustrated you become, the more easily it is to distract you because now your passions are shifted and your focus is put somewhere else. Are you with me? You've been frustrated on this job for how long? I'm going to leave it right there. And the frustration has built up to the point that now you don't even focus on it. You're going through the motions. There's no passion, it's just function. And, be, and the function requires, or the function rather, uh, requires that you have a lack of focus. Because if you ever start focusing, it will shift your passion. Revelation is, is the first thing. You have to come to this understanding. What is in me that I need to deal with and fix? Here's why it's a problem. The problem is not external, the problem is internal. Your joy is not based on external things, it's based on an internal knowing. It's not based on something that's outside, but it's based on what's going on inside. In whatever state that I'm in, Paul says, in whatever place you find me, I have learned, meaning that it, it was a process of becoming it wasn't instant, it's not a natural reflex, it's not our natural response, but he says, I have learned to be content in whatever state that I'm in. Watch, there's a difference between contentment and complacency. He didn't say, I've learned to sit there and stay there, but I've learned to be okay where I am while I go where I'm going. I've learned to be okay with what I have while I work to obtain what I want. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. He didn't say I'm complacent, but he says I'm content. And contentment is in any situation you find yourself in. And therein lies your ability to know that you are in a place or in a posture where internally you have the fortitude to do what needs to be done externally. Fixing it requires revelation, it requires conversation, 
You're going to have to open your mouth and have a conversation with others and or yourself or a therapist. Let that sit for a second. I know I'm in a, a, a predominantly African-American congregation at the moment, but sometimes we need to talk to somebody. P please understand that there's a, there's a spiritual counseling that you receive here, there's a coaching that you get here, but there's a clinical counseling that digs deeper and helps you understand the emotional psyche, helps you understand the principles and the, and the, and the, and, and the things that are going on on the inside that are emotional. If, I don't know why I just dropped in my spirit, but I'm gonna give it to you. It, it, doesn't really, it doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to him. If I break my finger, there are sales that come to the rescue. They literally begin to repair, <coughs> repair the bone, and it sends not just any kind of sales, it sends bone sales. If I cut my hand, the body, the mind is so incredible that it will send cells to rejuvenate and regenerate the tissue that is necessary in order to repair the cut on my hand. If I break my leg, it doesn't just send any kind of cells, but it sends the right cells to that location in my body to begin the process of strengthening and reforming, regenerating the bone that is in my leg. The mind is so incredible that it can send the cells that are needed to fix any part of your body except itself. The mind needs help repairing itself. Are you with me? So sometimes in order to fix it so that frustration will be dissipated, you've got to go get somebody to help you through the process of repairing your mind. Are you with me? Revelation, conversation, reflection, and then redirection. Maybe it's time to shift, to change in order to eliminate your frustration. But before you do, God has you where you are for a purpose. So focus your energy on fixing you before trying to fix the situation or before trying to change your location. Are you with me? Yeah. Fix you first. Otherwise, you take you to the next location. Wherever you go, there you are. And if the problem persists, the problem wasn't your situation, the problem was you. Just tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. Wherever you go, <laughs> there you are. If you move without fixing the common denominator, which is you, you put a Band-Aid on it, but you take the problem with you wherever you go. You're going to have the same issues over there that you had over here. If I left this church and somebody opened up a door and an opportunity for me to have a, 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 a larger congregation, a greater budget, a, a more phenomenal a, a, a ministry program or plan, and I said, oh my God, I'm sick of these people here. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. And I'm dealing with this. I preach the same thing and they're still acting like this. I'm, I think it's time for me to leave victory. I'm going to go to this other church. Well, I go to this other church and I'm dealing with the same stuff that I dealt with at this church because it still got people so my my challenge is not to fix the situation my challenge is to figure out what's wrong with me that I cannot see God's hand in whatever situation he allows me to be in focus tell your neighbor focus I have to get to the point where I understand that the problem is not external, it's internal. Because God will give you grace to be able to do whatever needs to be done in the season that he has you in. So you got to change your, your, your phrasing, change your emphasis. Instead of asking, why am I here? Ask, why am I here? In other words, what's your purpose, God? Why do you have me in this season, at this location, at this time? Amen. What is it that you desire to get out of me or for me to learn and for you to deposit into me in this current place? 
Instead of asking God, why me? Why, why me? Why am I going through this? Why do I have to deal with this? Why do I have to stay there and say, no, God, why do you have me here? Because you, you put me here for a purpose. What is that purpose? And when you start fig figuring it out or fixing it from that vantage point, it changes how you even see the outcome. It changes how you function and how you flow through that very moment. Are y'all with me? Amen. It's real quiet at 10 o'clock now. Y'all started turned up. It was lit just a few minutes ago. Now you're thinking, ooh, ooh, mmm, mmm. I'm still going to watch Power, though, but mmm. Ooh. <laughs> Come on, let's look at the text right quick and I'm done. In the text you had this phenomenal moment where Mary and Martha, Martha has had the opportunity to host Jesus the Christ in her home. You can't get any more honored than that. What kind of favor is this that Jesus is coming to your house to sit down, break bread, fellowship, and pour wisdom into you and your guests? And Martha opened a door to him and gave him the opportunity to, to fellowship and to break bread in her home. Can you imagine the excitement that went through that whole house? Like, oh my God, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And, 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 and you put it in context when you realize and remember who Jesus really is now. We're talking about the man who is notorious and the word of him has traveled throughout the land and people know that he's healed the lame. He's, he's made the dumb to talk and the lame to walk. He's healed, the blind, he's healed blinded eyes. He, he walked by the man at the pool of Bethesda and just said, hey, do you want to be made whole? Get up, take your bed up and just keep going. Same man that, that stood in the, in the middle of this gathering and they tore the roof off the home and lowered the man in front of him and he says, your faith has made you whole. And he gets up and takes his crippled bed and begins to walk out healed. Same guy that walked in Jairus' daughter's room and looked at the little girl and said, Talitha Coom, little girl, rise. That's the man coming to your house. Same one that, that literally stepped out on the bow of the ship when the tempest was, was, was rolling and, and the billows were rolling and the tempest was, it was high and the ship was being tossed to and fro and the winds were boisterous and the Bible says that he opened his mouth and just said, peace be still. And all the elements bowed down and asked, how may we worship thee? They had to be subjected to his authority. And that's the man that's coming to your house. Can you imagine how exciting that is that it was 5,000 plus people and they were all out there all day listening to him talk and somebody said, these people are hungry, we got to let them go. He says, no, they don't need to go, they need to stay because I'm the one that can provide food that they will never hunger, they'll never thirst again. And he took the little boy's sardines and crackers and he broke the bread and he gave thanks and it multiplied and he fed over 5,000 people and that's the man that's coming coming to your house Jesus is coming to your house can you imagine how excited Martha must have been and how excited her sister hey girl Mary check this out Jesus is coming to eat hold on let me get myself together I'll be there in a minute let me put my lashes on Help us, Lord. We see you. We see you. We see you, Mary. We see you. We know they ain't not yours, too, but we see you. <laughs> Help me, Lord. Pray for me. Don't talk about me. I'm doing the best I can. In verse 39, it says, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But I want you not to miss verse 40. But Martha was distracted. She sat at the feet of Jesus, but Martha was distracted. In order to obtain our focus and to make sure that in 2020 we have right focus so that the decade, not the year, the decade can be favored. So a couple things that you're going to have to do. First thing is acknowledge your passion. You're going to have to acknowledge what are you really passionate about. 
Is this just ritual or is it relational? Are you just coming to church just to say you came to church? Or are you coming because you are looking to have relationship and fellowship with Jesus? Here's what scripture says, Hebrews 12 and 2, Hebrews 12 and 2 looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Matthew 6 and 33 says it a different way. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, to be upright or right standing with God and all other things shall be added unto you. Jesus does not want us doing for him at the expense of being with him. And there's a lot of people who come to church for him, but you don't come to be with him. There's a lot of people who are serving for him, but you're not trying to have a relationship or to fellowship or to live with him. And what you, what you focus on determines your feelings and your feelings cancel your faith. Help me, Lord Jesus. Your faith is not based on feelings because if you'll be honest with yourself as I'm being honest with you, sometimes we just don't feel like it. Sometimes I just don't feel like praising. I don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes I don't feel like coming to church. Sometimes I don't feel like preaching. But my faith and my commitment is not based on my feelings. You got to check your feelings at the door and make a decision that I will command myself to worship. I will command myself to praise him. I will command my hands to be raised in his honor. I will command myself to be obedient unto him. It's not about feelings, it's about your faith. But what you focus your attention on changes your feelings. Watch this, so you have to focus your attention on his word. Because his word is what's going to build your faith. And the problem is sometimes we, be, we become so consumed with the ritual that we skip the relationship. We're more concerned about being able to say, I went to church, than knowing the transformation that happened because I have been in worship. We're more consumed and more concerned about the time and the timing and the convenience of it that we miss out on the opportunity to see God do an incredible work in our lives. It has nothing to do with the ritual. It has everything to do with the relationship. Because if you come and you praise and you worship out of ritual, then you're like tinkling cymbals and sounding brass. My daddy used to say this when he would be preaching and I was a kid. He said, an empty wagon makes a lot of noise. <laughs> but the desire is to be filled with his presence so much so that you know when I walk away that I have been with Jesus. How many of us come and just raise our hands because the pastor say, all right, everybody lift your hands. Instead of saying, God, I surrender. Some of you are in the moment, but you're not in him. You're into church, but you're not into worship. You're into it. You're into looking good and feeling good about what you're doing, but you're not into making him feel good about what you're doing. And it's ritual. It's not relational. Martha was distracted, but Mary was sitting at his feet. Mary says, do you know? Girl, them dishes can wait. <laughs> Do you know who's here? We've heard about him. I need to sit and spend as much time in his presence as I can. Because in his presence, I found fullness of joy. In his presence, there is liberty. At this very moment when I am in his presence, I'm not worried, ain't worried about nothing. I need to be in his presence because that's the most important thing. So you've got to know, first of all, what are you passionate about? Are you more passionate about church than you are worship? Are you more passionate about serving on this ministry or serving here than you are knowing that you are servant of the most high God? 
Are you more passionate about telling somebody I'm a member of this church versus I'm a member of the kingdom of God? What are you most passionate about? You got you to gotta determine and you got to acknowledge what your passions are. And if they're wrong, you need to make them right. It's not about the ritual. I really long for the relationship. The second thing that you need to do if you're going to revamp your focus and make sure that you're ready for the decade is you need to assess your people. Oh, help us, Jesus. I got to ask myself the question, do I want to be around Martha who has a chip on her shoulder or Jesus who is a chip off the old block? I, I need to make a decision. Do I want to be around Martha who is distracted by her feelings or Jesus who is building my faith? Pay attention to the fact that Martha, Ma Martha got issues. Martha obviously has some emotional issues because she comes in and tells Jesus, our guest. Let, let, me, let me paint the picture for you. I'm sitting down at the feet of Jesus, captivated, hinged. My hope is hinged on every word proceeding out of his mouth. I'm sitting there at the feet of Jesus, who is our guest. And you walk in and tell our guest, oh me. <laughs> and then ask our guest to check me in front of everybody else. You got issues. As a matter of fact, you, 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 you know how we got down when we, got, we grew up? What go on in this house? You don't bring nobody else, an outsider or a guest in our business. Are y'all with me? That was cause for a whole, and, then, and, and, and that's how the fight started. <laughs> she has some emotional issues. And then look at the content of what, not just the context, but the content of what she said. Martha says, Jesus, do you care? That my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? See, here, here, here's what I want you to know. That Martha and Mary were sisters. Are you with me? So the issues do not disappear because you're related. Your family can help destroy your focus too. So you got to assess the people around you. And here's the tough pill to swallow. Some people that might be trying to distract you or that the enemy is using to destroy your focus might even be in your family. Oh, help me, Jesus. It doesn't mean that I'm not still family. Doesn't mean that we're not still related. Doesn't mean that I don't still have fellowship with you. Doesn't mean that I'm not even still friends with you. But not at the expense of my focus when I am sitting at the feet of Jesus. I cannot allow even you to destroy my focus on what is right. Are you with me? You need to assess your people. Martha, who obviously had issues, are you going to choose her or Jesus who is speaking words of healing to your soul? Are you going to choose them or are you going to choose him? Will it be the people that give you, give you encouragement or will it be God that gives you encouragement? Third thing that you need to do is you need to abandon the self-pity. Martha came and woe is me. Lord, do you see all that I'm doing by myself? Why do you need to throw in by myself? Because you want everybody to know what you're doing and ain't nobody else getting credit for what you're doing. Feed my ego, Jesus. Build my pride so that I can be led into destruction. Y'all didn't see me. I served on the usher's ministry. Ain't nobody said nothing about me. 
I'm the one that picked that paper up on the parking lot. I was just driving through. I saw it. So I stopped at the church and said, I'm going to do this. Nobody said nothing about me. And I did it all by myself. Jesus. Somebody praise me. Celebrate me. Pump me up. Say amen to me. That's self-pity. That's arrogance and entitlement. That's haughtiness. And you got to understand that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the what? The fall. So the way to rid ourselves of self-pity is to change our focus. Instead of looking inward, you got to start looking upward. You're looking for validation from people instead of, instead of affirmation from God. And when people become your focus, you will live your life trying to find the affirmation of people. But here's the problem with that. You have to build your hopes on things that are eternal. Build your hope and your foundation on something that is immutable, unchangeable. Here's the problem. When you start looking at people for validation, affirmation, what you do is ultimately you set yourself up for failure because people are fickle. People will celebrate you and shout Hosanna on this corner and the same people will shout crucify him on the next corner. You can't hold your hopes on people because people change. God is unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So build your hopes on receiving affirmation and approval from somebody who changes not. And unfortunately, what has happened in our culture is that this digital age has done a disservice to us. Because we feel that we have to pimp ourselves for people to give us a like. And the language that has been used is so incredibly wrong that we have now started to concede it. Remember, what you feed yourself, what you allow in, will eventually become what you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What happened is that we allowed the social media diaspora to communicate to us that these people are your friends. How many friends you got on there? How many followers do you have? They don't follow you and they're not friends with you. They just nosy and can't wait to see what they can destroy. Oh, help me, Jesus. My friends are not trying to kill me. They're trying to build me. And if you don't believe it'll happen, just post something they don't like. And watch them come out of the woodwork and the enemy use people to try to destroy you. And you're saying, but these are my followers. That's why God has anointed me, blessed me impeccably and incredibly, has endued the power of the Holy Spirit over my life to the degree that he has gifted and graced me with an extraordinary phenomenal block ministry. <laughs> My block game is strong. I ain't even got to read all of it. If I see a few things at the top, oh, no, no, no. I can't let that in my spirit because I'll spend all night worrying about what you said and forget about the 10,000 people that just said something good. Swipe, block, delete. Slap somebody say, focus, focus, focus. Focus, 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 focus. You got to know who your real friend is. You got to know who your real, your real confidence has to be in him. You got to rest in him. Are y'all with me? He is my friend that sticks closer than any brother. He is the one that will walk with me, that promise he'll never leave me nor forsake me, that he'll be there even to the end of the age. He is the one. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust, not even the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. 
My hope is built on nothing less than his blood and his righteousness. You got to get over people. And you got to relieve yourself of self-pity. Woe is me. Let me tell you what self-pity does. It speaks to your lack of faith. When you start wallowing in your own pity party, it speaks to your lack of faith. Psalm, the 37th number of Psalms says, trust in the Lord and do good. Eat, dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When you start lamenting in anguish where you are, then what you say is God is not going to give you what he said he's going to give you. Because hope is gone. It also cancels gratitude. It's hard to be gracious. It's hard to express thanksgiving when you're lamenting and complaining and murmuring about where, you, what you, where you're in this season. Here it is, Colossians 3 and 15. Let the peace of God, to which also you are called in one body, rule in your hearts and be thankful. In all things, give thanks. You can't give thanks and complain at the same time. Instead of saying, Lord, thank you for being in my house. Thank you for coming and fellowshipping with us. Thank you. Who are we that you would take the time to visit us? Who are we that you even sit down and allow us to have the opportunity to sit at your feet? Thank you for coming about. No, she came out the kitchen saying, Lord, with a duster on. Lord, walking on the back of the house shoes. Lord, don't you care? I used to tell my daughter all the time, it's, it's not about what you say. Sometimes it's even about how you say it. I just want to ask for Jesus, who are you talking to? Don't you care that I'm in here working by myself? He says, she says, tell, tell her to come in here and help me. Help us, Jesus. You got to strengthen your focus. If you're going to change the direction, you have to strengthen your focus on him. Philippians 4 and 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, guess what? Think on these things. That's the only way you're going to get your attitude of gratitude back. That's the only way you're going to shift your focus back to the right standing with God. Is you're going to have to start thinking on these things. And that means sometimes you got to cancel some people's access to you. Because you're causing me to think on other things. You, you, you've seen people, that'll, they'll gas you up. They'll get you right together. And when you start thinking all those things and you start being a guardian and a protector of everything that you allow to enter into your space and into your face, people will stop talking to you. Expect it. They're not going to want to talk to you because they want misery loves company. They want you to pump them up. They want you to say all the things that make them even more mad than they were when they first brought it to you. They're looking for somebody to sign off or co-sign on their frustration, anxiety, their stress, or all the things that are shifting their focus off of God. They come to you because they want you to be like, yeah, you right, I, I know it. And then and you walk away and you're ready to go fight. You walk away and you're saying, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I think you need to tell them. You need to let them know. You know, when you start clapping your hand, you need to let. I'm trying to. Ain't nobody putting up with that. Get them together. You got to show them. Yeah, I'm getting ready to go cuss them out right now. I mean, both of y'all leave, but one of y'all go to jail. At some point, at some point, you're going to have to strengthen your focus. And strengthening your focus means to assess your people. And it means to get over your own self-pity and start saying, God, help me to think on the things. I used to get so upset. My mom, I told you I wasn't going to use you no more. I can't help it. The Holy Ghost said it's okay. I hope it's okay with you. <laughs> but I used to get so upset. My brothers and I both. I don't know if Kevin was old enough, but Kenneth, my middle brother, he, we used to get so mad because I don't care what you brought my mother. I don't care what you said, 
I don't care how bad it was. Mama, and then they did this, and then that. My mama was going to find the good and the God in it somewhere. <laughs> well, son, the Lord, I don't want to hear about that right now. I need you to, I need you to get mad with me. So when people bring you stuff like that, they want you to be mad with them. I need you to be miserable with me. I quit. I'm tired of coming. I ain't singing at that church no more. Them people don't want to worship God. They just sit there with their arms folded, looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm done. Well, son, you're singing for an audience of one. You're not, I'm not trying to hear about, no, I'm talking about them people, not him. She always seemed to find a way to think of the good, and I don't care what situation it is, she was going to find God in it somewhere. Because she had figured out Philippians 4 and 8, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are just. Think on these things, lovely things. Think on these things. You got to refashion your thinking because as you think in your heart, so you become. Are you with me? Fourth thing you need to do is adjust your peripheral. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only few things are needed. Indeed, really, only one. Some of you are so consumed with so much. If you've ever been to a parade, you'll note that when horses come down through the parade, they put blinders on their eyes so that they remain focused on what's in front of them and they cannot see all the things that are taking place beside them. It's for their safety and the safety of everybody in the parade that they remain focused. So you're going to have to learn in 2020 how to put blinders on your eyes and the blinders are simply the word of God. If you put the word of God around you, it will cause you to remain focused on Christ and all the other distractions will not take you off course and cause you to hurt yourself or for you to hurt somebody else. There's too much going on on the sidelines that doesn't even matter. You got too many things that are pulling your attention, but you're gonna have to learn how to simplify. You know why Apple is one of the greatest and one of the strongest corporations in the world right now? It's because they figured out a formula that everybody else now is trying to copy. Simple. Babies can use it. They made it simple. It was funny to go to Microsoft and find their store set up just like the Apple store because they figured out they have simplified and we need to model or take that as a model. Simplify. You're going to have to pare down because indeed only one thing is important and valuable and that's Jesus Christ. And the thing that I really celebrate, this is, this is, this bless me, Martha, Get it together. You worried about too much. But only few things are needed. And indeed, really, only one thing. Now, it didn't mean that what Martha was doing was wrong. He never said what you're doing is out of order, what you're doing is wrong, or you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. But it simply says in the text that what Mary chose was the better thing. So whatever you're doing in your service to him, you're not wrong. But Mary chose the better thing. And the better thing was to humble yourself, put your own agenda on pause, and sit down at the feet of Jesus and simply worship him and be fed by his truth. That was the better thing. The problem is you're choosing other things that might be good things and might be okay, but until you choose to put your agenda on pause and sit at the feet of Jesus, you are not choosing the better thing. And this is what I really got excited about because he also says, and I know that you came to tell on her and you thought that I was about to check Mary, but let me help you understand. She has chosen the better thing 
and it will not be taken from her. It doesn't matter your circumstance or your situation. If you choose to worship Jesus, it will not be taken from you. The favor that she had in that moment where he fought for her and shielded her even from somebody else's disagreement or somebody else's dis disdain, she received the favor of God in that moment and he says, you can't take that from her. She has chosen to be a worshiper and you can't take that from her. He, she has chosen to praise me, to honor me, and to be humble enough to bow down before me and I don't care how you hit her, you cannot take her, that from her. You can take her job, but you can't steal her worship. You can take her money, but you can't take her praise. You can take a lot of things out of her life, but you cannot take her love, her thirst, her hunger to be in my presence. I don't know who else feels good about that, but I'm glad that whatever the devil throws at me, he cannot take my worship he cannot steal my praise. God will not shut it off and he will not shut it down. He can't take it from you. He cannot take it from you. There's a lot of things that you might lose. But that's the one thing that the devil can't touch. Here's the problem. We don't do it because we're not as humble as she was. In humility. The Bible didn't say she stood and watched. The Bible didn't say that she, she, she hung out on the sidelines. The Bible didn't say that she, she was just there, but it gave a specificity to her posture. She sat down in front of him. Here's the question. When he enters the room, do you sit or do you stand? Because kneeling before him Sitting before him is a posture of humility. Bowing your head is a posture of humility. When he enters into the room, are you too busy to, to even notice that he's there? Are you too occupied with your life that you don't even realize who's in your presence? Are you too caught up and consumed in your own vocation and your own situation and your own circumstance to realize when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is even in your midst? At what point do you stop, put everything on pause and say, I need to sit at his feet? Here's the problem. Many of you entered into this place today without a heart to worship him. You just came to see what you could get, but you didn't bring anything to give. And the thing that I love about him is that he doesn't require much. All he asks is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. All he asks is that we give him thanksgiving, that we enter in his courts with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. He only asks those minimal things of us and it's the least that we can do for all that he's done for us. At what point do you put your own agenda on pause? And say, God, thank you that in spite of everything I endured in the last decade, the enemy still couldn't shut down my praise, my worship, my thanksgiving. I just need the real worshipers. This ain't for everybody. But for the real praisers, the devil tried to steal it from you. He went and told on you. He is a false accuser of the brethren. He tried to tell on you, but he still could not take your... Come on, open your mouths and give him what he deserves. Come on, give him what he deserves, not what you feel like. Give him what he deserves right now. Forget about your feelings. Give him a sacrifice of praise. We sit at your feet, Jesus. We honor you for being our God. We thank you for being our Savior. We give you glory right now, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. He cannot take it from us. You have chosen the better thing. Doesn't mean all the other stuff is wrong, but you've chosen today 
the better thing and it will not be taken from you it will not be taken from you it will not be taken from you I don't care what this decade yields it will not be taken from you I don't care what you got to go through in the next 10 years it will not sitting at the feet of Jesus it will not be taken from you and your worship is your weapon the enemy cannot stand to be in the presence of a worshiper because you invoke the very presence the manifested glory of God and Satan cannot stand to be in the presence of the glory of God it frustrates him because it messes up his plans his plan is to distract you from God so that you lose your worship and you silence your praise but he loses you win in Christ Jesus he loses every time you give God glory he lost every time you give God a hallelujah he lost every time you lift up a thank you Jesus he lost hallelujah that praise was for 2019 that praise was for 2010 through 2019 this praise is for 2020 through 2030. I need somebody to give God praise for the favor that's coming. Your focus is coming back. Your faith is going to increase. The favor is about to fall. The glory is about to come. Come on and give God glory in this place. Honor him for being our incredible God. Hallelujah. Glory. Lord, I thank you for just being my God, my Savior, my Lord, my King, my everything. I bless your name. I thank you, Lord, for being the incredible one who oversees us when we need to be overseen, who protects us and shields us even from the hand of the enemy when he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I thank you, Lord, for your awesome power to order our steps in the path of righteousness. Thank you for the guardrails of grace and mercy that have not allowed us to be consumed by the hand of the enemy. And thank you for another chance to come into your presence, to sit at your feet, and to worship our King. God, we bow in humility right now saying we can't do it without you. Focus will fail if you're not present. And so God, we ask that you would allow us to stay in your presence over this next 10 years. God, we ask that these next 10 years don't look like the last 10 years, but it look fruitful and that it look abundantly favored. Let it be evidence that we have placed our confidence in an incredible God who wants to do incredible things on our behalf. Thank you for revamping and refashioning our focus so that we can hear you clear. Silence the voice of the enemy. Every distracting thing that he has spoken to our spirit everything that is plaguing us with insecurity and depression silence his voice right now in the name of Jesus and cause us to be increased and elevated let us know who we are and whose we are and thank you Lord that even as we begin to revamp our focus even as we put things back into the proper perspective that your favor is going to overtake us in this season thank you for increase Thank you for restoration. Thank you for healing. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for another chance. Thank you for the turnaround. Thank you for the shift. Thank you, Lord, for the, the, in, the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, for what you are about to do in this season. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, make the devil angry. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah and amen. Come on and give God glory in this place.